You see all that snow? It is cold at my house right now. Today on Dirt Lifestyle, we're gonna continue a series that we already started like a year ago, but I finally have a pallet full of parts over there to go on this 2021 Tacoma, and we're gonna build a super legit third gen Tacoma rock crawler. So here's how I want to start this video. I'm going to start with just this little brief explanation. We're going to get right to work because we have a ton of work to do this month on the taco. I want to have this at King of the Hammers in all of its glory and that's like 30 days away or something. It's not even that far away. So we're going to talk about that big old pallet of parts at the end of the video, not the beginning. Right now what I want to do, tear this Tacoma down, get all the old parts off, pull the diffs out, and we're going to, at the very least, I want to be able to get that clamshell re-geared because I've never done one and I think it's going to be a little bit time consuming. Taking all the parts and pieces off of this Toyota Tacoma is a breeze. Not only is this a brand new truck only having 8,000 miles, but honestly the way this is put together is super simple, very straightforward, and nothing's really that overly complicated. Unfortunately, the 2021 Toyota Tacoma did not come with a locking front diff as an option from the factory, but that's not the end of the world. We are going to install our own locking front diff from ARB, and I sourced this through Randy's Worldwide. A lot of people don't realize Randy's deals with more than just Yukon. They also sell ARB, which is good because ARB is like the only major company around here that I can find that makes a locking front diff for the clamshell uh, front, front axle on these Toyota Tacomas. This is a 529 gear set, and I know it's easy to get intimidated by this clamshell front diff, but at the same, at the end of the day, this is the same as a Dana 60, Dana 30, Dana whatever. You just, you need to read the instructions. It'll tell you what the final specs need to be when you're done. The difference is how it's packaged. So we're gonna be disassembling our axle in a different manner than a Dana 60, but at the end of the day, it's still the same relationship between your ring and pinion. You just gotta make sure, we, we just gotta make sure that when we're done with this, it meets these specifications and we're gonna be all good to go. The first step to our re-gear project is gonna be stripping off all the little goodies and doodads and clearing this off to where all we're looking at is just the ring and pinion. This includes removing the ADD, and the ADD system is basically just a front disconnect because Toyota, like all vehicle manufacturers, is trying to pick up every MPG where they can. So their theory is that if they disconnect the front axle and you're not in four wheel drive, it'll make it to where you can get slightly better fuel economy. I'm gonna reuse the pinion bearing and race on this install because they're super low miles and it looks like driving in a brand new race would be kind of a nightmare because of the position that it is in this housing. But there's no reason to doubt that this pinion bearing and race could last a couple hundred thousand miles easy as long as I take care of this setup. common practice to run a flat file along the back of the ring gear to make sure that there's no dings or anything that's going to make it wobble once you marry it to the carrier. If there's a little bit of a burr or a little bit of a ding, usually you can file it flat, but in this case this is machined perfect and we're not going to have any problems.
I know a bunch of you watching are complete noobs and have never set your own ring and pinion. So before we read the pattern, which is really, really important, I wanna do a quick rundown of what we did to get to this point so you understand what it is that we're looking at and why we're checking the pattern. So we started with the pinion depth. And all we did to get our initial pinion depth is I just took the old shim off the OEM pinion and I pressed it underneath the bearing um, on this new pinion. Now, this is called a crush sleeve. We're not gonna do the crush sleeve yet. I wanna do the crush sleeve last, not first, because we're not at any big rush. <laughs> so all I did is I put the factory crush sleeve in there. I zipped all this together and I could, wanted to make sure that there was drag, but not so much drag that it feels tight and it's hard to turn. This is easy to turn, but it's not so easy that I can just like zip it and it'll free spool, you know? And so we have a little bit of drag on the bearings, which is exactly what we're looking for. Now we can look for backlash. And the way we're gonna set up our backlash is by putting a shim behind the race on this side of the housing. Because what's gonna happen is if we shim that race up or down, that is going to move the relationship between this gear and that gear. Because if you shim it, if you add shims, it's gonna make it farther away and make your backlash, backlash looser. Or if you take away shims, it's gonna make it closer. And so once we got that within spec, we got it to, I think uh, the spec was four to eight and we're like at five, so it's beautiful. It's time to set the carrier bearing preload. And actually before I did that, I just did a really quick, just cheater pattern. I painted the gear real quick. I pushed on it and I just kind of spun it just to make sure that the pinion depth was even close. And it looked, even though it was sloppy looking because <laughs> it was a sloppy method, I was able to tell that we were close. So I felt comfortable moving forward. Now, the last thing we need to set is the amount of preload that we have on this side because basically the shims on that side are not to set preload. The shims on that side are just to set our, uh, our backlash and then we can actually put the right amount of preload with this side. So if we want more pressure between these two bearings, we add shims in here. If we want less pressure, we take it away. The way A or B recommended you do it is you throw the entire shim pack, you press it, or not press it, you just, you have it behind the race, and then you take a measurement between, because there's gonna be a huge gap, you take a measurement with feeler gauges, and then you should know how much to take out of that pack. On paper, that's like, you know, that's a great strategy, I love it. But in practice, I found it very difficult because this thing wanted to be leaned one way or another and I couldn't get an accurate feeler gauge measurement all the way around it. So all I did was just, I just kept removing shims until this thing was flat. And then it was still a little bit tight when I was spinning the pinion. So I pulled like 5,000th more out of it. And now it spins freely. And that's as close as I can get it without whatever tools Toyota uses to measure preload in these things. So I'm comfortable with the amount of preload we have, and now we can finally check our pattern for real. And we got super lucky. This pattern looks mint, and honestly, nine times out of 10, when I use this method where I just take the factory shim off of the old pinion and put it on the new one, it gets me so close. I mean, this pinion depth looks perfect. And for those of you that have never read a pattern before, in your Yukon book, it has acceptable patterns. The whole thing is this pattern is going to tell us whether or not we need to remove shims from our pinion or add shims from our pinion. And so you can follow the instructions. And uh, if you have any understanding of how all this stuff goes together, it's actually pretty simple. It's just time consuming. That's why you pay so much whenever you pay for someone to install these for you. Now, the next thing that I wanna do, now that I'm comfortable up until this point, is I'm going to pull the pinion back out. We're gonna crush our crush sleeve and we're gonna to start to assemble things for the last time. Even though I've invested a couple grand in gear install tools over the years, I still don't have a tool to hold the yoke when you do a crush sleeve. And this is unexcusable. Honestly, it's way cheaper than a lot of the other tools I've bought. But the good thing is we're in a fab shop, so whipping something up to hold this is not gonna be a big deal.
The Soyda Tacoma came with electric rear locker from the factory and I've had no issues with it, but I will apparently after talking to some folks that own some 4x4 shops and doing a little research online. These don't like big tires and that Tacoma is going to be on 38 inch stickies and it's going to be on the hardest trails in America. So there's a little bit of slop in these and if you have any sort of wheel hop, I guess it makes the slop makes them much more prone to blow up when you have a larger tire on it. And we're going to have some big tires and we're going to be pushing it really hard. So right now it's worth money because it's not exploded. And so I can sell it and get some decent coin because for the right build, this is the perfect locker, just not for us. Another reason to upgrade is that I don't want to have to ask the computer for permission to use a locker. This is going to bypass the computer system completely, make it to where two wheel drive, four wheel drive, four low, doesn't matter what situation I'm in. I can push the button and we have a functional locker. Now, this is my favorite style diff to set up. This Ford, Nissan, Toyota, Land Rover, Suzuki, they all use this style and it's just so much easier than that clamshell that we set up earlier in the video. So I'm gonna do the same thing I do with the clamshell. We're gonna start with our pinion, we're gonna work our way out from there. Because we have so much better access to all the races on this one, we're not gonna reuse any races, any bearings, whereas if you saw the front, we did reuse that one bearing in that one race, just because I don't have a tool that's gonna make it easy to drive the new race. So even though all these bearings and everything only have 8,000 miles on them, all the Yukon parts and pieces are super high quality, and so since we're gonna have it all out, we're definitely gonna replace this stuff. I used to have a boss that would say, it's better to be lucky than good, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> That's a good looking pattern, and we just got super lucky. First shot, uh, pattern looks great, and all that we've done to get into this ballpark was we put the factory shim behind the race. There's no shim behind the bearing on this rear axle. The shim was behind the race, so we put that behind our brand new races that we drove in, and uh, once we set our backlash, we ran our pattern, and we're looking good. So for those of you that are new, we're not gonna use the technical terms for this gear because I want this information to penetrate and I wanna make it easy for your average person to understand. So we're gonna call this our peak, we're gonna call this our valley. This will be the inside of the gear, the outside of the gear. There's actually technical terms for all this, but you don't need to know them if you're an amateur, in my opinion. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk about how important it is to keep this pattern in between the peak and the valley. So and that's exactly what we're looking at here. So even though we're a little bit closer to the outside of the gear than the inside, that's acceptable. What we don't want is for this bare spot to be running up off of the gear or down really deep into the gear. This is, this is money. And it's the same thing on the other side. The other side looks great. And in the Yukon book, you will find a bunch of patterns and there's acceptable patterns, pinion is too close. It'll tell you exactly what to do. We mirror this one almost exactly so we were offset just a little bit, not a big deal. This is a perfectly acceptable pattern. And in my experience, I'm not gonna lose any sleep about running this pattern. This pattern looks beautiful. So now we're gonna strip this back apart. We're gonna clean it up. Uh, we're gonna crush that crush sleeve. And then we're gonna have some tricky stuff that we're gonna need to do in order to run this airline. And I'm gonna build some special plates and stuff to block off these holes.
I couldn't help myself. I had to roll a couple of these wheels under here. Just take a peek. Oh yeah. 38s are gonna look so good on this. Now it's gonna be pushed forward a little bit more um, and we're gonna change a whole bunch of stuff on this truck, but I can at least look at the stance. I think we'll be close to this height when it's all said and done, but we'll see. We'll see in this next month as I build this truck. So as far as these go, they're ready to rock and roll. They're ready to install. I, you know, every time I do one of these third members, I say I'm gonna build some sort of a stand for one for these because I do them so often. And uh, once again, I just put it on blocks of wood. <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but it's ready to rock and roll. It was super easy to do. The front, a little bit more time consuming, but honestly, still just as straightforward as any other diff that I've put together. I did change one thing on the front. Um, once I installed this little 90 degree jammy that came with the ARB on the rear, I decided, you know, if I use that same fitting up front, that would be kind of nice because it's gonna help route our airline up and I can just zip tie it to our vent tube. Now at the beginning of this video, I made a promise that I was gonna talk to you guys about the basic build plan for the Tacoma. So let's do that real quick. 38 inch Milestar Patagonia black label tires. These are supposed to be a really nice soft compound, really good in the rocks and this, I love rocks. So basically we're building this Toyota in the next month. So I have a rock crawler and then here very soon, we're gonna tear this TJ like all the way down. This has been my rock crawler for years, but I'm finally gonna build it the way I want it. And we're gonna basically start from scratch. That's a whole nother, whole nother video. So um, there, we're mounting it to methods. These are method bead grip wheels. So on the, uh, on the bead where the tire mounts to the wheel, to be clear, for those of you who don't know what a bead is, it's like, I don't want to say serrated, but it has ribs that go all the way around it. And I was actually pretty surprised. I was at four wheel parts. One of the biggest advantages of these wheels is the fact that it's not a bead lock. So you can take it to any tire shop and they can mount and dismount it for you. That said, when I was at Four Wheel Parts and uh, they were airing these up, it was crazy how much air it took to seat the bead <laughs> on here. So I think that getting it to unseat on the trail, it's, it's supposed to resist low tire pressure. How low? I don't know, but we're gonna find out. But I love the finish on these. I think the bronze is gonna look great. We're actually gonna wrap this truck so I've got a bunch of vinyl on the way. I just dropped a ton of money on vinyl and I think the vinyl I chose is really wild and it's gonna look super good on these method bronze wheels. And we'll, when we actually go to mount this, all this stuff up, I might revisit our wheels and stuff and talk a little bit more about those. These fenders are from, uh, this box is full of fenders and bedsides from McNeil Racing. They're plus two inch. So they're gonna be two inches wider than the stock fender. And then we are gonna have the Marlin Crawler RCLT. And I'm only the second person to receive the plus 3.5 kit. So this is gonna be seven inches wider than stock. It's gonna be wider than it sits right now. <laughs> it's gonna be wild. I wanted, I want to show that these can be made real rock crawlers. In stock form, yes, you can put it in rock mode, but they are not good in the rocks. But with enough good tooling and good parts and pieces, these can be outstanding in the rocks. And we're going to have crazy good ground clearance from this RCLT kit instead of doing a straight axle. Now we're going to be using, in these boxes, we've got RCVs front and rear, or sorry, front and rear, jeez. Sorry, it's been a long day and it's 17 degrees out here. Uh, these are RCV axle shafts. They're warranted up to a 40 inch tall tire. So I figure with a 38 sticky, there's no reason we should ever have an issue with these. I wanted to undersize just a little bit to give us some flexibility and make sure that this stays super reliable. And then we're gonna be doing Bill Stein coilovers front and rear. Before you go, Toyota people, I need your help. I've got some things that I haven't figured out on this truck and I would love for you to comment and let me know your recommendations. So the first thing is switch panels. I'm gonna have to, I've got a bunch of things that I'm gonna add to this truck that are gonna require a switch inside. So what? who makes a nice clean mounting solution for a switch panel that I haven't discovered yet? I know there's lots of universal stuff out there. I could just do a kit like I did on my Land Rover and that's fine. I could double stick tape something to the dash like I did in the Land Rover, but I would, I'm sure someone makes like a 3D printed something where you just remove a panel in the truck and boom, you've got rocker switches. Like that's what I'm looking for. Something that's really nice and clean and has a good, uh, good fit and finish. 12 volt compressor. What do you recommend 
for something that like fits in that secret cubby that I haven't discovered yet or whatever in the Tacoma. I'm sure someone makes a special bracket that shoehorns a compressor somewhere behind a fender or under a seat or whatever. So please let me know who does stuff like that. And because uh, there's a lot of compressors I could go buy. I just need to know which one is gonna fit the best in this without me having to reinvent the wheel and bend and build a bunch of bracketry and stuff. Uh, speedometer adjustability. How do I adjust the speedo to match these 38s? Um, I'm sure someone tunes it, right? So let me know in the comments. Do I need to send the ECU to someone? Is there someone in the Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia area? That's where I live, I'm up here. Is there someone in the Pacific Northwest that could help me out with that, that has a computer that can tune this thing? Or not necessarily tune it, but tell the computer like, oh no, this is how fast it's actually going. So let me know in the comments for that. And then the last thing, TRD Pro Hood. I want this truck to look as dope as possible. We're gonna do a full wrap. I've got a lot of money in vinyl on its way to my house right now. I'm telling you, I'm throwing the kitchen sink at this because I have not enjoyed the Tacoma so far. We're gonna throw everything we can at this to make it as dope as possible. And even down to a t uh, the TRD Pro Hood, I think this is one of the best looking trucks you can buy. I love the third gen Taco. And with the TRD Pro Hood, it just looks next level. So if you're anywhere local to where I just described in the Pacific Northwest and you're selling a TRD Pro Hood, I know some people hate the TRD Pro Hoods. So if you just wanna trade, I'll just trade you for this hood. It's got 8,000 miles, it's a brand new hood. So if you're interested, let me know in the comments for that as well. And the last thing we're gonna talk about before we go is testing air lockers. I completely forgot to mention this. And as I was writing this list, I realized I need to make sure that everyone who hasn't done an air locker before knows you have to bench test these before you install them. So the only reason you didn't see me bench test these is because all the testing gear that I have built so far is all for the zip lockers. This is ARB and it's a six millimeter line. I think the zip locker might be a five millimeter. Either way, my current testing equipment won't work. So I ordered the fittings I need, they're on their way. So that's why you didn't see me bench test these, but it's very important. Never install a locker back into a vehicle without bench testing it first. Cause it is a huge, huge heartbreak. If you put it all in there, you flip the switch and nothing happens. So uh, anyway, if you wanna help support the channel, you go to thedirtlifestyle.com. Make sure you like all the videos, subscribe, all that other stuff that you do to YouTubers that make cool series that you like. This series is gonna be wonderful. Those of you that like third gens, you're gonna to wanna to stick around for this one. If you, wanna help, uh, if you wanna help support us on Patreon, we have a link to our Patreon account on our website as well. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Nate. We'll see you next time.